it's such an honor to be here. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be quite the Ole Miss day, so I have to say hotty toddy, although the other recipient isn't here. Uh, I was not planning on saying that in the state of Alabama. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they'll get me back for that soon since it's football season. Uh, but it is really an honor uh, to be here and to honor Dr. Norwood and all of her contributions. Uh, what I thought I'd do today is give a talk um, about some of the areas, um, not necessarily areas she worked in, but sort of a, uh, the type of research, you know, the type of collaborative research where you're working in a big team, you're learning from others. And so I'll talk a little bit about two projects that I was able to work on, uh, both of them uh, while I was at UNC and one um, that's continuing even now. Uh, I, as Lloyd mentioned, uh, he was actually the person I remembered the most from my interview there um, from coming from Ole Miss um, up to North Carolina. I think I wore a bright red pantsuit, uh, which um, in Boston I learned you don't wear color, but a uh, bright red pantsuit with a yellow shirt. I still remember going up there. And when I interviewed for a job uh, five years later, I was petrified somebody would remember me. I never knew you remembered me, but Suchi outed me. Um, the, our admissions director remembered me when I was interviewing, so I thought, oh no, I won't get the job he's remembered I said no already uh, so that worked out just fine uh, and they were really really great to me on both location I mean both occasions and it was a great experience there uh, one thing that's nice uh, about Duke is that, uh, that I have a professorship there and uh, Charlie Ayers uh, was a Duke student and Sarah was a UNC student and they got married so I still kind of carry on the both UNC and Duke tradition there so to talk a little bit, uh, I just wanted to say a few more things uh, about Dr. Norwood. I really appreciate the comments before. Um, it makes me sad that she's not here with us. But she was a trailblazing scientist and leader. And she was really passionate, as you heard, about keeping science and data separate from politics. And that's really important um, in society that we can understand these things as separate. And as statisticians, of course, this is sort of where we come from, right? We try to give just the facts and we don't necessarily give the facts that somebody wants to hear. We're trying to explain uh, what the data say and not necessarily um, can we support a hypothesis with our data. Uh, at one point, uh, I found it was interesting listening to one of the interviews of her online. She went to a meeting with a resignation letter in her pocket because she thought that the political decision was going to violate her own personal sense of ethics. And I thought that was nice that she would admit that she did that. Most people talk about the good parts about their job and not necessarily the bad parts about their job. Uh, I think at some point I had drafted a resignation letter after a particularly bad day at work, um, but fortunately I never I, I sat on it. Um, she went to a lot of meetings, she said, and I was the only, always the only woman there. And then she went on to say, but it wasn't really a problem for me. And I think I really appreciate uh, these women who took these positions and made it, to me, seem completely normal for a woman to be in a room and not to have that kind of experience myself. And so I really appreciate people like her who helped pave the way. Um, and it's wonderful to you, um, of you, to honor her legacy in this way. So it's really great to be here. So what I'll do today, I have uh, sort of two take-home messages. Both are statistical methodology problems I found interesting uh, that raised a lot of um, there were, one of them I got interested in only because of the methodology, which is so not the way I usually do things. And the other, I got really interested in the application and then found out there were a lot of things I didn't know how to do. Uh, and so how do we address this? Uh, I'll consider some drawbacks of existing approaches to answer some of the questions we ran into and talk about how that led to new methodology questions. And for me, when I started my job, I was the most scared about how am I ever going to come up with something new to do? You know, like I've gone to grad school, I did what my advisor said, I listened, it all worked out, um, but how am I going to come up with ideas on my own? I had a hard time, in you know, visualizing that. And so I'll kind of walk you through the process in the context of these two studies. Uh, and so before we go there, I want to talk a little bit about um, leaders and leadership, uh, you know, as a way to tie in again to Dr. Norwood. And I think there are a lot of ways we can do this in our field uh, that don't require us to be, you know, a high-ranking government official. Um, hiring junior faculty, you know, really kind of deciding the face uh, of the next generation and mentoring them, junior faculty, postdocs and students, and taking the time to promote them. 
both within your own discipline and sometimes I think it's even more meaningful when it's across disciplines and I think one nice thing about USAB is that the research is very interdisciplinary you know sometimes it's really great to have good friends in another department where you can talk about things that are going on in your own department but it's not necessarily like talking to your sister about a problem you've got with your mom but you can talk to somebody who's sort of distinct from that get advice from them so that's a really nice um, nice way that we can mentor people uh, recognizing the existence on the planet of junior faculty members, postdocs, and students. And so one thing for me that was really nice is when I did come to UNC, Lloyd would stop by with another one of our friends, Keith, and invite me to lunch. And we just walk across, it was the med school cafeteria. There was nothing fancy about lunch there. But it was so nice to be able to go with people, to have a conversation, instead of just being kind of shut up in my office working on my own thing, um, worried that I'm never going to have a good idea and things aren't going to go well. So it was really, um, I really appreciate that. It was really meaningful to have somebody that like remembered I was in my office and that I might like to eat food. So, um, and whether we talked about sports or we talked about statistics, it was still a lot of fun just to get out and chat. Um, and then remembering and admitting to others what it was like to start when you're new, you know, because I think it is a struggle and uh, we kind of constantly redefine busy and sometimes we think, oh, graduate students aren't busy, you know, because um, you, you become busy in different ways and I think sometimes you forget those things. So it's good to acknowledge that when we can. So I'm really grateful to people who are still at UNC uh, and who used to be at UNC for really helping me and showing me the way. Uh, to be a good role model and to try to help other people and I'm delighted that I um, have some students that I had the pleasure of teaching and who are now colleagues. Uh, it's great to see them too. So you guys are doing a great job. So, so the first study, um, so I'll talk a little bit about labor but not Janet Norwood's kind of labor, um, at least um, not at work, uh, is the pregnancy infection and nutrition study and when I came to UNC uh, I wasn't put on any projects right away, but people set up a bunch of meetings for me to meet people and decide what would be interesting. And so I met with David Savitz, who at the time was the chair of the EPI department there, and learned about the study. And I thought it sounded really cool. There were collaborators in epidemiology and in gynecology and obstetrics and nutrition, all sorts of different departments. And another really fun part of this project was that a lot of the boots on the groundwork was done by grad students. And so a lot of the papers got written, for example, by an EPI grad student working on their dissertation, and they needed somebody to help with the statistical analysis and design the analysis plan and things like that. And so through this project, I learned a lot not only about how to do collaborative research, but also about how to mentor students and how to work as part of a really highly functional and successful team. And so this was a study that enrolled women while they were pregnant. It followed them depending on the phase of the study, um, either until their baby was born or for some women as long as three years after uh, the baby was born following the children for some of their developmental um, outcomes. And they had tons of hypotheses. So um, they asked about biological factors, behavioral factors, uh, and other things that were related to positive pregnancy outcomes and um, child weight, child neurodevelopment. And in fact, the first study I ever was asked to um, collaborate on on an NIH grant proposal was one of these big R01s that funded this study. And I completely had a panic attack when I saw the grant because I started counting up the exposures and I had no idea how I was going to do a power calculation for a study that measured everything. And I remember going into the office of a professor in our department and saying, I have no clue. I learned like two sample t-tests and two sample tests of proportions. And I think I've counted 300 predictor variables and I don't know how to do this. And so uh, that's when I learned about primary versus secondary outcomes and how to explain and communicate what we were going to do. Um, a lot of these hypotheses were exploratory, um, you know, not confirmatory and so forth. So, so it was a really interesting study, but I, it was hard for me at first. So uh, there were meetings that were really long, like one whole morning a week, and the meeting would talk about operations, you know, like challenges in the field. I, the freezer, I still remember the stupid freezers. I, why do I need to know what kind of freezer you're going to put the specimens in? Um, so all about the freezer. And so what I did, because the meeting was, you know, three hours about a freezer, and I was a junior faculty member, and I kind of wanted tenure, is I stopped skipping the meetings. And so then I get called into the PI's office, who explained to me very nicely, but he totally dressed me down, uh, about how I really needed to be part of the team and come to meetings. Uh, and so that was sort of a low point for me. But then what happened, um, after I got in trouble, 
is that uh, he sat, he, you know, even in the meeting, I didn't do a very good job of advocating for myself. I'm not sure I even vocalized, you know, I can't stand to hear about the freezers one more time or I might explode. Um, and we restructured the meetings. And so the first half of the meeting was operational and they would talk about the freezers and things like that, that um, at the time I felt like I didn't need to know anything about. And then the last half would be more on research and we'd get updates on projects, we'd talk more about analysis, and then that made it seem a lot more manageable to me. Now, of course, after all this, what happened is there was a power outage and the stupid freezer went offline. <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, your first thought is like, crap, I should have gone to all those meetings about the freezer. <laughs> um, so, so the freezer died, the samples thawed, and then, so then we actually had to design a study, a validation study of what happens when you thaw and freeze samples to see if we had to throw away other samples or not, if we could still measure the things we wanted to measure in the samples. So at the end of the day, the freezer was really important, but, um, but at the time I really did have freezer nightmares uh, in the study. Um, through this process, I came to be really close friends with a lot of people on the team, and so um, if I visit them even now, or if I visit the town where they are, um, a lot of people have moved on, but I want to see them catch up, talk more about what they're working on. And they really taught me how to do collaborative research, which was not something, I went to a graduate program that wasn't strongly collaborative. And so I didn't get the experience that people here at UAB get or that people at University of North Carolina get where they're really touching real data. I never touched real data. It was all very sanitized and very clean. And I, yeah, uh, so I didn't know, you know, what to do uh, when you saw some out liars that, you know, oh my gosh, really, uh, maybe, you know, um, it, I had been really insulated from that. So this was a great place for me to start. And it worked really well. So we got tons of papers. They were a really productive team. And, um, but I also was able to work with some really great people who've gone on to be faculty members and, um, and researchers in institutes all over. And this is just um, sort of a subset of people uh, that I was able to work on um, coming through the UNC system in this study. So it was a really great experience for me. Um, and for example, Stephanie Engel was one of the first people I worked with. She was a grad student at the time, and now we have a couple of grants together um, and be on the phone on Thursday talking about another one. So, um, so it was really a lot of fun and had the opportunity to do a lot of fun stuff, including side projects. Um, for example, uh, Leanne, I'm not sure when you were in labor, if you were actually working with them or not, but probably so. Um, so uh, that's what happens when you work with OBGYN. Uh, you can consult in all sorts of situations, but um, lots of fun projects. So, uh, so the paper I want to talk about today and the problem I want to talk about arose as part of the dissertation of Nancy Dole, who, like a lot of students here I've heard at UAB, she was a project manager and decided she wanted to go back and finish her PhD. And so she was getting her PhD in Epi, and she was really interested, but she knew everything about the study. She was great. I learned so much from her. And she was interested in stress and the role of stress on preterm birth. And, uh, and we pulled in David Dunson, who's a collaborator and, and also my husband, uh, because uh, David and I have been having an argument about latent variables, okay? And so, um, so it's a long story and that's not relevant. But anyway, we pulled him in. David was right. Um, so anyway, uh, but the prior studies in the literature had shown some positive associations with stress and preterm birth and some negative associations with stress and preterm birth. They're kind of all over the place. And in this study, what they did is they used a questionnaire called the Life Events Questionnaire to try to get at stress. And if, if you've worked with stress data, you may have seen this questionnaire. And it asks you if a variety of events um, occurred, and if they did occur, you know, was it positive or negative, and how positive or negative it was. And so, uh, at the end of the day, they have what's called graded agree disagree data, disagree data. And I'll show you in the next slide what it looks like. Uh, the interesting thing about the data they collected is that, well, stress can be good or bad, okay? So you could win a big award, and that's really good, okay? That has a really strong positive impact maybe on you. Um, but then, you know, you might also have something that could go both ways, like a change in your financial status. Well, that could be great, or that could be bad, or that could actually be a little bit of each, right? I could stop working two jobs, which is a good thing. I have more time, but then I have less money. That could be a bad thing. And so a lot of the items on this questionnaire could be perceived as good or bad, and the women were allowed to report them either way. Uh, and so Nancy's question for her dissertation was, how do I characterize stress? Do I count how many of these 37 events a woman said she experienced while she was pregnant? Do I count the only ones she called negative, only those negative ones as stressful? Do I count positive events as stressful at all? Um, and then when the women said they had an event, they had to say, oh, is it extremely negative, somewhat negative, mildly negative? So how do I take that information into account in modeling? 
And so the things that Nancy did in her dissertation, she took a sum of all the, of all the events you experienced, so just you know, how many out of 37, what's that proportion? She counted up only the negative events, she counted up only the positive events, and then she took those counts weighting them by the severity of the event. And she looked at all those measures to try to see if any of those were more tightly or less tightly linked to preterm birth. Uh, you could have gone through the literature and looked at, well, how negative is, you know, divorce? Uh, I think it depends on what you're interested in studying, and there wasn't a lot of work on that. So here's an example of the data. And so at top I have the impact score, uh, and these are all for events that occurred in a population of just over 1,500 women. So the first event is divorce. You can see on the right, only 16 women got divorced while they were pregnant in this study. But their scores were all over the map. Okay, and in fact, they were more likely to say it was positive than negative. So maybe if you get divorced while you're pregnant, you're really ready to be divorced. Uh, but, you know, but it wasn't just a positive thing. It wasn't just a negative thing. Marriage, also the same way, right? It was largely positive, but some people perceived it as very negative. You know, maybe they had to get married or felt they had to get married at that time, and they didn't feel like that was their decision. You know, engagement, that was mostly positive, but still a couple people said that that was negative. And then there were things that were more easy to see how they would go both ways, a change in the number of arguments, a change in your finances, uh, changing your eating habits, all the way down to death in the family, which again, some people rated as a positive thing. And you might imagine so in some situations, if somebody's really suffering, that you might, you know, score that as positive. There was even death of a husband that came through as strongly positive. And <laughs> there it was like, hmm. Um, <laughs> Do we have to report this to somebody, or is it okay? Uh, but anyway, so you can see it's a little hard to make a decision about, you know, how we summarize these data, what's going to be important for preterm birth, where should we go from here? And so a couple things that we wanted to be able to do that uh, after talking with Nancy is, one, we wanted to allow for the fact that these events have really different impacts, okay? So a change in your eating habits is probably something everybody expects to some extent when they're pregnant. Um, you know, it can also, it could be really bad if you had, what, hyperemesis, gravidarium, whatever, uh, where you're throwing up all the time. But for the most part, maybe that's not so bad, whereas something like a death in the family or a divorce might have a much stronger impact. So we wanted to be able, even if a woman gave the same event, these two events the same scores, to recognize, you know, maybe on average, you know, a death is something that's going to be more impactful than a change in your eating habits on average. Uh, we wanted to allow for uncertainty in the weights. So, you know, everybody's filled out these questionnaires, and sometimes it's really hard to know, is it a minus two or a minus one? I don't know, I'm just going to throw something down. Uh, and the other thing that we noticed when we were doing analysis, exploratory analysis of the data, are that the women were differential in how reactive they were to events, okay? So some people were like, you know, oh my gosh, I had a change in my eating habits. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me, you know? And, and I had a, you know, got a $5 raise, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And whereas other women would keep everything between minus one and one, no matter what it was, okay? So some women used the whole scale. Other women were really tight around the middle of the scale. So we wanted to recognize that the same thing could happen to two people, but we might report differently um, our perception. You know, it's kind of like the pain scale at the doctor, and it's on 1 to 10, and they ask you how much pain you're in, and you're thinking, well, I'm not dead, you know, my leg's not been severed from my body, you know, I guess I can't really go too high, but, um, but you might still be really hurting. The other things we wanted to do, um, like Nancy had struggled with, we wanted to allow positive and negative stress to potentially have different impacts. And so uh, we built on two types of models that we had seen, that you might have seen in the literature. Uh, one's a cumulative ordinal model. So if you're skipping categorical, you're not really. So ordinal data, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, right? Um, and then also building on discrete choice models. So these you don't often see as much in biostatistics, but these are multinomial regression models, right? What kind of toilet paper do you buy? Things like this, you pick one. And so the idea was that um, with a discrete choice framework, that's going to be positive versus negative, and then how positive or how negative we would use draw on a cumulative ordinal model to do that type of analysis. And so in particular, we used a latent variable model. So, so our argument was, you know, um, are latent va variables all that useful, really? And um, why don't we all just always call them random effects? And so anyway, we had a lot of philosophical discussions about that. But in this model, we, decided, we thought about the concept of 
um, for every event, you've got sort of an underlying level of positive stress and an underlying level of negative stress. So if you think about, you know, draw, you have two jobs and you drop one, okay? So I'm going to have some positive stress associated with that. I have more free time. Maybe I can take a pregnancy class. Uh, on the other hand, I have some negative stress because my salary just got cut in half, okay? Uh, and so each woman has some underlying positive and negative uh, reactions to an event. And if the positive, if she has an event, she's going to have this indicator variable W that takes the value 1, otherwise it's 0. And then if W is 1, the score she's going to report from minus 3 to 3 depends on whether her positive stress outweighs her negative stress. And if it does, then she's going to report a 1, 2, or 3. And if it doesn't, she's going the negative stress dominate. She's going to report a minus 1, a minus 2, or a minus 3. And if they're about the same, she's going to report it doesn't really, you know, uh, maybe doesn't really have an impact. We could come back to that. That maybe is not necessarily how you want to treat the 0. Uh, and then the score she reports, the Z, well, this reported score, or not the, the, the underlying score Z, sorry, is going to be a function of how impactful the event is on a positive and negative scale and how impactful or how stress reactive she is on a positive and negative scale. Because we also didn't want to say somebody's always the same amount of reactive for a positive event and a negative event. Like maybe I'm just very sunny and I'm always going to say something's between, you know, one and three. And maybe if I'm pushed, I might say zero or minus one. But really, I'm positive. Whereas some people might tend to be more negative about things. So, um, so depending on her underlying tendency to be positive or negative about uh, in reacting to events, and depending on whether it's, for example, a change in church activities or a death in the family, that's going to determine what her underlying stress levels are. And if the positive level is more than the negative level, she's going to say it's a positive thing and vice versa. And so then for our summary scores that we use in our modeling, what we're going to do is sum the latent reactions for the events experienced by each. So if she had, if, if the underlying negative latent variable, um, even though she reported a positive score, we would still use the underlying variable for the negative reaction in determining a, a negative stress uh, variable in the model. So, so we allowed events to work both ways, depending on how often that happened uh, in the data set. So how do we model this? So the way Nancy modeled it is she just looked at the top quartile of stress, however she had it characterized. And so we did the same type of thing. We took our latent variable and we thresholded it at the top 25% so that we can make comparisons to what she'd done to start. Uh, in terms of the modeling for preterm birth, which is a binary outcome, uh, our computation was a lot easier with a complementary log-log link, which is one you don't see a lot. Uh, it has really similar fit to a logistic or probit link function, uh, except in the tails. And you usually have to have a whole lot of data to be able to tell the difference in fit. So that's what we used. Uh, and then we also compared to what, so we compared to what um, Nancy did. And what Nancy found is, uh, so what every epidemiologist dreams of, p-values of 0.1. Uh, OK, so, so now we have all sorts of issues of what to do with that. So she didn't see a lot of stuff going on. But one of the things that she didn't really like is when she summed the weighted scores, you know, she was basically saying if a woman coded something as a minus three, that was like having three events happen that were coded as a minus one. Does that make any sense? You know, and so, well, you know, maybe in some cases, but probably not across the board. And so uh, we wanted to just look at using this model to do something a little more flexible. What did we find? So first, I'll tell you a little bit about things that contributed to the positive and negative stress scores. So things that had big weights uh, when they happened and that affected the positive stress scores were things like marriage, engagement, change in family closeness, change in church activities, outstanding personal achievements, change in number of arguments. Things that didn't seem to impact positive stress at all, well, a lot of these are things that tend to happen in pregnancy, right? Changing your sleeping habits, changing your eating habits, changing recreation, changing social activities. Separation from partner because of work didn't seem to have a big effect. Borrowing money, okay, of any amount didn't seem to have much effect on positive stress. What about negative stress? Well, one thing that's interesting is that out of the things that had big impacts on positive stress, several of them also had big impacts on negative stress. Change in number of arguments, change in family closeness, change in church activities. Those things could go both ways. Other things, a change in financial status, being separated from your partner, a change in your partner's work. Uh, all things that contributed more to the negative stress, and these were the loadings in the model. And then some things didn't seem to matter at all for negative stress. Um, a minor law violation, borrowing money, change in social activities, and so, you know, parking ticket rates, things like that. So, 
So that's sort of how things that got more weight or less weight, regardless of what the woman said on the scale. Okay, so we're upweighting these things and downweighting the things on the bottom based on the data. So we fit this model in a Bayesian framework to allow us to do computation. The posterior probability of an elevated risk of preterm birth among women in the top quartile of negative stress was 95%, okay? And the posterior risk ratio was something like 1.4, so a reasonable estimate. Uh, we didn't see anything really with positive stress. So there was, you know, the point estimate was in the protective direction, but the interval estimate was really wide. So it was consistent with really not much going on there in that study. Um, and so what happened after that? Well, it led to more collaborations with the PI and with the co-investigators. We were able to leverage this to get some funding from NIH. The RO3 is a really nice mechanism for junior faculty because it's a small amount of money and a short application. Uh, you just tell them your idea. We got lots of other grants, both on the method side and on the collaborative side, which was fun. It led me to work with a team on birth defects, which is something that I'm still working on now, uh, which is a really good group of people. And it actually led to the next project, which is completely unrelated to this one, uh, except that it was a friend of Nancy's. So um, you get collaborators, right, in lots of interesting ways. And so um, the next collaborator I got sort of from this project was one of Nancy's friends. And she introduced me to Carolyn Halpern, who was a researcher in maternal and child health at the Carolina Population Center. And she was writing a grant to study adolescent sexual development um, in the ad health cohort. And my first thought was, oh my gosh, I know nothing about teens and sex, and I really don't want to know more about teens and sex. <laughs> and I don't think I even have a conversation about this with somebody. Um, but then I, I met with Carolyn because I really liked and respected Nancy, and Nancy said that I should do it. So, you know, if somebody I respect tells me I should do something, I think about it carefully. So I met with Carolyn, and the data were really cool, okay? Um, not, the, not the sex part, um, but, but the data structure itself. She asked me what to do, and I had no idea. And so that was a really cool methods problem. Uh, and it also led, if we have a little time, I don't have a watch in this really cool room. Uh, if we have a little time, I'll tell you about a collaboration it led to uh, with a priest um, and some others um, on this study. This is a really cool study, Ad Health, and I'll tell you a little bit about it because the data are freely available. So you can go online and request the data. It's a population representative longitudinal study. They took adolescents in 7th through 12th grade uh, in 1994 and 1995, okay? Uh, and they were followed in three, uh, now four, survey waves, okay? And the, uh, the study was interesting. The study was designed as a study of adolescence and sex. And that was during a time that Congress was relatively conservative. It didn't get funded. And so what they did is they added some health outcomes, hence ad health is what this study is called, okay? So they added some health outcomes, said it was a health study, and by the way, we're gonna measure some sex things, and got it funded. So, um, so you guys probably have experience knowing how to navigate these waters. That's what they did. Uh, they were really worried about, because they were asking a lot of questions that were personal about people suing to try to get them. For example, if you got divorced and they want to know if the, the, oh, we did that survey last year. I wonder if you were having an affair. So they store all the identifiers in Canada to keep them outside the purview of the U.S. legal system should something like that come up. Uh, but they have a lot of really interesting confidentially collected data, and I'll talk a little bit about some of it. Now, the interesting thing about this grant that was really innovative is that Carolyn's very interested in studying what's normal in terms of adolescent sexual development. So a lot of the work that had been done had been around, you know, adverse outcomes. So teenagers getting pregnant, teenagers getting diseases, things like that. But not necessarily more um, broadly scientific interesting, scientifically interesting concepts of, you know, what's typical for kids, you know, like what's normative so-called behavior. And so that's sort of what this whole project was about. And, uh, and in particular, she was interested in sexual orientation, and there were questions on the questionnaire about what, um, whether girls or, and boys were attracted to girls, to boys, about their behaviors and about their identity. And it's not a lot, for example, um, you can take behavior as one, right, that levels evolve with age. So you have more partners as you get, or you certainly have um, not fewer partners as you get older, right? Uh, although, actually, in these data, sometimes you do. But, um, but that's because it's self-report. Uh, but, so we know that levels evolve with age, but what Carolyn was interested in is the covariance. So what's the association between attraction and behavior and identity, and how does that association evolve as people go through adolescence into older adulthood? 
And so we have data from three waves of the study where on average the kids were 16, 22, and 29. Okay, and so I'll show you a little bit about what the data were. First, this is from Abigail Hayden's defense. She was a student I was able to work with who worked on these data. Um, it's a school-based multi-stage population representative sample. Okay, so they sampled schools and then they sampled people within schools except for schools that were saturated and so forth and they took everybody. Uh, it was confidential data collection via a caddy. There were questions you could not ask of adolescents because they were felt to be educational. And so we'll encounter some of those, uh, but they couldn't ask everybody everything at every time. And the survey weights for this study are very important. In particular, they went after oversamples in certain groups. So there was a large oversample of disabled youth. They took twin, if you were a twin, they tried to get your sibling for genetic purposes. They were very much interested. Uh, there was a group, a subgroup of investigators at UNC, uh, I think in sociology, who were really interested in educational outcomes and trying to tease out race and socioeconomic status. And so they were in other contextual factors. And so they oversampled uh, kids who had college educated parents, for example. So there were all sorts of interesting oversamples in the study, uh, meaning that you can't ignore the weights. And so these were the measures. And at this point, this is when I got really interested because the, con the hypothesis is about correlation and how correlation changes with time. But we have a measure that's attraction, and so everybody was asked at every wave, are you attracted to girls, are you attracted to boys? And you said yes or no, and all the combinations of those variables were observed. Um, they asked for a partner count, okay, so how many partners have you had of the same sex, how many partners have you had of the opposite sex? Um, so these are fun, I'll show you some of these. These are fun data if you like digit preference. Um, so these are real values from the data. So um, I don't know how you count to 347 if you have a belt and you're making notches or what you're doing. Um, but it's not, you can see even in the lower counts, there starts to be digit preference and rounding. And I don't know some of these people are really precise. Um, identity, which uh, ironically out of these questions was the one they couldn't ask people while they were in school. So they asked if you were 100% heterosexual, 100% homosexual, bisexual, anything in between. Uh, and that was felt to be too edgy to ask in 1995 to a seventh grader. And so that was not on the questionnaire. This is nominal data, not ordinal. So bisexual, you can't just, you know, my hope was in analyzing the data was, oh, can I make this an ordinal scale and can I stick bisexual in the middle? And you see people shaking their heads. This is exactly what Carolyn said. And I asked again, and then the next week, is like, are you sure? And she's like, no. So, uh, so that, made, uh, that made my model a lot harder to deal with, but, um, but a lot more fun at the same time. Now, why do they ask all these different questions about sexual orientation and identity? Well, the relevance depends on what you're interested in. So if you're interested in an outcome like getting an STD, well, then we're really interested in your behavior, right? So um, if I'm interested in something like depression, then maybe I'm interested in your behavior being really different from your identity. And so um, depending on what your outcome is, you might be interested in one or more of these indicators. And Ad Health now in the field is doing some work where they're trying to get much better indicators, especially for sexual minorities. At the time, what they have is maybe not what was perfect, but the best they could do in a questionnaire that's trying to measure lots of stuff. Now, I'll let you know kind of a little descriptive statistics. Um, each icon here represents 1%, and so in the first wave, we had 6% um, of the women, for example, had any indicator of a minority status. So that means they said that they had had, um, of the three, they had at least had a partner of the opposite sex, or they were attracted to the, I mean, a partner of the same sex, or they were attracted to the same sex, or they were not 100% heterosexual, okay? So that's any indicator. So that's the loosest definition we could think of um, of minority status. You can see that's increasing, especially with women increasing with age, um, not so much increasing in men with age. And then all indicator minority status would mean you have a current partner, you're attracted of uh, the same sex, you're attracted to the same sex, and you identify with something that's not 100% heterosexual. That's much smaller, uh, but again, you see that increasing in both genders now with age. So. Um, of course, your partner count's not going to go down unless you've lied, uh, which, yes, yeah, 14-year-old uh, boys, certainly, um, there was at least one who had 1,000 partners when he was in junior high, <laughs> and for some reason later on, uh, it wasn't quite so many, zero at the next wave. So, uh, see, there are some um, fun measurement error issues in the data. Um, so, so I didn't know what to do with these data because we had nominal variables and count variables and binary variables, and how do I model their association even at one time point, much less how do I uh, model how that changes over time? 
And I've got a survey weight, which means it's harder to be Bayesian um, and use that computational machinery. And so, you know, these questions of interest, is the association between measures of attraction and behavior varying with age, or do the association with identity and behavior vary with age? I had a hard time figuring out what to do and what to put in the grant application to convince reviewers we could do uh, that, was, that was pretty straightforward. And so we ended up in the grant putting in an aim that was more methodological to, to just try to develop some new methods. And we tried to do the best we could, and I think we blathered along about some sort of latent class trajectory modeling of each one separately um, in the grant. And so what we ended up doing is we viewed this as a multivariate response. Uh, for each participant at each age. Uh, we needed to have this response model that let us have things measured on a variety of scales. So here's an example, like in wave one, you might have a female who's age 15. She's got no partners yet. She says she's only attracted to men. Um, she's not telling us about her identity because she wasn't asked at that age. And then at wave four, we might have a man. He's 29. He's had seven partners. Two were same sex. He's attracted to men and women, but he's mostly heterosexual and so forth. So this is what the data look like. And we're interested not in means, but in associations. And so there, were some, there had been some work, uh, in particular around copulas, to estimate correlations of variables on different scales that we found was relevant. Um, they assumed things were ordinal, which is why I kept going back to Carolyn saying, please, can I put bisexual in the middle? And Carolyn continued to say no. Um, so, uh, so here's what we did. So we did use a latent, so again, latent variables come back. Uh, a latent variable modeling approach, and so, and we're linking an underlying latent variable. So the latent variables are nice because I could assume, for example, they're Gaussian. And I can do things with Gaussian correlations that are data that are multivariate and longitudinal. I can estimate that correlation matrix. So let's have an underlying variable on, we can start to think of it, underlying, a bunch of underlying Gaussians, and then we'll threshold them. You know, so for a binary variable, if your underlying variable is over a certain amount, you're going to be a 1. And if not, you're going to be a zero and so forth. And we can do the same kind of thing for count variables, a thresholding approach, which is super nice, uh, especially for people here who've sort of worked in this area, because it's a nice way to handle zero inflation. And we have a lot of zero inflation in these data, especially when the kids were in middle school. You know, hopefully I have a 14-year-old boy, and I hope he's in that big point mass at zero right now. Um, I'm partners. And, um, you know, and so there's a lot of zero inflation, especially when they're young in terms of their partner counts. And also when they're older, when we're looking at the same sex partner count variable. So we need to be able to do something that can handle that and not just hold our nose and pretend that we don't have zero inflated data. So, so that was a nice thing. We can handle ordered, ordered categories for all intents and purposes or very handled in a similar way to counts in these data. Um, and then we can also use a latent utility type modeling approach for the discrete variables, um, the nominal discrete variables. So, um, so now we have an underlying variable, and then I'm just going to specify a model on that. And so y star is my underlying variable. It's going to have a mean that's a function of t, which is age or time, and x, which are covariates, so things that we know um, affect how they report. Okay, these are basic demographics. Things like age, things like gender have big, big effects. Um, there were some racial effects that were of interest in the study um, that had been shown to have effects on, um, on the means. Uh, and there were questions about whether there might be effects on correlations. Okay? Um, so for example, uh, for most races, boys tended to have more partners at a given age than girls, though not among Asians and other things like that that had to tie, in, um, tie into people's behaviors. So that, that was an interesting variable where there were some interactions that we had to worry about. And so we built that into the mean model, but then we also wanted to be able to build in structure in the covariance model so that I could evaluate the hypothesis that this correlation changes with age, or that this correlation is different by gender, or by race, or by educational level, which were the main things that we evaluated. Uh, and so that's what we did. So we built in a latent variable structure where you can see eta ij is a latent variable for person i at time j. And I'm going to let that latent variable depend on covariates x. So in this model, it was gender, it was race and ethnicity, and it was educational level. And then I'm also going to let that covariance depend on time. And then through that latent variable structure, I'm inducing, if I integrate them out, um, a response distribution for y that's normal. And I have a mean that depends on covariates and time. And then I also have a covariance that depends on means. Uh, that depends on time and covariates, okay? So we do this a lot of times in longitudinal analysis, right? We, um, when we fit a random slopes model, we want the association to be a function of time. So here we have an association that's not only a function of time, which is measured as age in this cohort, 
but also a function of gender, a function of race, a function of education. Um, and so we're modeling uh, the time effects in particular, modeling smoothly using a Gaussian process. So uh, just to let you know um, how that worked. There were a couple of things we still weren't happy with. Um, one, we have still been holding our nose about the weights, so we haven't figured out what to do with that. And two, we weren't really sure the underlying normal really held. And so that one was a little bit easier to handle. So what we did is we just nested this um, model in. <laughs> this looks really scary, but really it's not. So we actually just used a mixture of normals. Okay, So you can model things very easily using normal mixtures. And that actually turned out to be really helpful, um, really helpful for the weights. And so I'll come back to that. Um, so we're just nesting a parametric model in a Dirichlet process model. Um, it was, it was really not that bad, but that's not what the talk's about, so we won't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but the weights were still a problem, okay? And um, because for Bayesians, once you put a weight on it, it's not a likelihood anymore. So what do we do? Um, so we burned out one student entirely trying to figure out what to do with weights. Um, <laughs> but I think he didn't really like the sex made him uncomfortable to um, the talk. Uh, but then uh, we reached out because there was a graduate student at Duke who was really had done some interesting work in sampling. And, uh, and I met with him. It was maybe the most uncomfortable meeting I've ever had with a grad student uh, because I, when I told him about the project, he's like, oh my gosh, I love sex. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. Um, but he was really funny. Uh, and so, uh, so he was really excited to work on the problem. Um, and he got really into the weights issue. Okay. And so, um, so he was, so she was great. And he came up with an idea for how to handle the sampling weights. It turned out to be a really neat one. And it works for any mixture model. So it doesn't work in any general situation, but it works for a mixture model, and that's what we had. And all it involves is reweighting the components in the mixture using the survey weights. Okay? So we do all our estimation in our Bayesian framework just like we would normally. And then at the end of the day, we're going to resample using these new weights that have involved invol now our um, now our survey weights in order to make population representative inferences. The byproduct of that that was really cool is in his framework, you, don't, you treat the weights that you're given in the survey as measured with, as not known without error, but as potentially subject to error, which is nice because sometimes in small groups, we're doing adjustments for missing data and things like that. We're not exactly entirely confident that, that weight is the God-given known true one weight. And so we got uh, that for free um, in some sense. We ran a few simulation studies to compare to some methods out there. And so if you look on the left, for example, uh, on the bottom left is our model ignoring the weights. And this was just a really simple case of normal mixtures. The true is green. And so we found the two mixture components, but we put the wrong weights on them because we're ignoring the fact that we had oversampled in one group and undersampled in the other. But using the proposed method, we were able to get the shape back exactly. Okay? And then we're looking at um, this method. It's using Horvitz-Thompson weights. We're using a random effects model. Rod Little had um, extended the above method to handle this a little bit better. And then a Gaussian process model um, that Yuwa John C. and Natasha Pillai and other people, um, Andy Gilman, had worked on uh, at Columbia. Um, and so those were the three things that we used in the simulation. Uh, it took us a really kind of complicated simulation setup to beat Andy Gelman's methods, which is why I'm saying we're looking at a mixture of mixtures. Uh, he did pretty well until we got there, uh, but he's, he's pretty good, so uh, he's hard to beat. Uh, but anyway, so and it worked well in more simple situations as well. So now let's look at the partner count data. So we applied it there. So this was like a side project. We put everything on hold to try to figure out what to do about the weights. So we wrote up a short paper where we looked at weights, and it's on the top you can see the partner counts um, by wave. So red on the left is, you know, 1994 to 1995, so the average age is 16, average age in the early 20s, average age in the late 20s. And so you can see um, what the distribution looks like at those three um, waves. And then also what we've done on the bottom is we've isolated the counts so you can hone in on the tail or on the mass and the distribution. So on the bottom left, that's zero to five partners reported. So the red line is when they're young, still in middle school and high school, and now you can see the zero inflation there. This is all partners. Um, and then you can see you know, up to one, two, three, four, five partners. Six to 15, and then 16 to 40, what's interesting here is you can start to see the digit preference, where people are saying things like 20, 25, 30. 
um, when they're doing their reporting. So, um, so the partner counts are really cool data if you're interested in measurement error um, because they're not always uh, increasing or non-decreasing with age. If you're interested in digit preference, things like that, they're sort of interesting data in ad health. Um, but anyway, we were convinced that we were doing an okay job. And so we implemented that for the weights. We went back to our main project and we wanted to see what was going on. So to measure association, the way we did it here is used um, Goodman and Kruskal's gamma. And all it does is compare concordant pa pairs, so who have the same sign looking at the differences in two variables um, versus discordant pairs. And we do this through Monte Carlo sampling of our estimates, adjusting for the survey weight. So what we find, um, so here I have, uh, not very creatively, um, pink for girls and blue for boys and lavender for the overlapping interval estimate. So the lines are point estimate and then we have an interval around it. It's, it's the, the jaggediness here is really because we're estimating this from 4,000 samples, okay, at the posterior. So we could up that sample size and they'll get a little smoother. Uh, but if you look on the left, this is the attraction questions. Attraction to same sex, attraction to opposite sex. And we're looking across age from when they're say, you know, 12 was about the youngest um, up to the mid 30s, okay, was the oldest in the older cohort. And this is a pattern we saw a lot in a lot of the indicators. Um, the men, the blue, when it was um, an association, they tended to have stronger associations in terms of more extreme. So you would think same attraction to the same sex and attraction to the opposite sex might have a negative association on average. That is what we saw. It was stronger in men than it was in women, okay, uh, in this cohort. Now when we looked at all the other factors, for actually for all of these different measures, we didn't see any differences in the covariance um, over race and ethnicity or over socioeconomic status, okay? There are things, uh, those variables do ha um, lead to differences in the mean model, but not differences in the association structure. But we did see biggest differences in the association with age and with gender. Uh, now, when we look on the right, um, I freaked out when we saw this plot because I thought we've done it wrong. So this is same sex partner count and opposite sex partner count. So again, if, if you know, after looking at the attraction plot, what I expected to see here for partner counts was a negative associate, as a statistician, um, a negative association, okay? Uh, and I do see that, we did see that in boys, but we didn't see that in girls. And so I thought, um, so we we're meeting, I'm meeting with Siyoshi, it's like, oh, we screwed something up, are you sure you didn't flip the coding, what's going on, let's go back and check the data. We check the data, we can't figure out what we did wrong, so we go to meet with Carolyn, and we're sort of embarrassed because we've got something like dumb now, we think, because we have um, the plot on the left and the plot on the right, which seem to conflict. And she said, oh no, she said, this is entirely what I would expect based on the literature that for a girl having more partners overall is associated with lots of more risk-taking type behaviors. And so having more same-sex partner, I mean, having more opposite sex partners, I would also expect to see a higher probability of same-sex partners in that same girl. So that was consistent with the literature. Um, so even though we tried to figure out how we could fix our model to get rid of it, it turned out it was actually um, not an error. So that was good. Um, just to show you some of the other things we saw, again, opposite sex attraction and opposite sex partner counts were positively associated and there wasn't a big difference there in the association between girls and boys. There's a lot of overlap in those intervals. Same sex attraction and same sex partner count, uh, again, tightly associated, the, but a stronger association in the men than in the women. So, um, so there tended to be a little more fluidity around the women um, than in the men in this sample. Um, and so some, these are some more of these things, opposite set attraction, same sex partner count, negative association in both. And then here again, we see that same phenomenon, same sex attraction, opposite sex partner count. So if you're attracted to the same sex, one might expect to have fewer opposite sex partners, which we did see in the boys, but not in the girls, which again, Carolyn said, that's the same hypothesis that this is you know, associated with more risk-taking risk behaviors in women. Um, interestingly, when we were doing some later work looking at depression and uh, healthcare access, uh, we saw differences in access to healthcare actually based on sexual orientation identity in men and women, where men who identified as a minority tend to have better healthcare, and women who identified as a sexual minority tended to have worse healthcare and worse, worse outcomes. So, um, so there was an, um, a disparity there, unfortunately. So here's some more, here are all the other combinations. Uh, and you can see the nice thing. So for me, it was super cool to see these plots because now I'm looking at association parameters. I'm able to see in this example, for example, um, not much is changing over time. 
It's a shorter time period though, because now we're looking at heterosexual identity and they weren't allowed to ask about identity when the kids were still in school. And so it wasn't until they were in their 20s, they were asked you know, basically if they were heterosexual or homosexual or whatever, however they would like to identify. That didn't change a lot in that age range over time, but we didn't measure that variable younger in adolescence. So it's hard, you know, we can't really say what would have happened if we'd had measures before then. So when we're restricting ourselves to these variables, which are measured only in adulthood, we're not seeing as much time variability, but we are seeing big gender differences. Um, now, as part of these studies, um, this might have been the craziest paper, um, but the most fun summer project I ever had. Uh, we looked at a project, um, this was before we started this, and there was a grad student in maternal and child health who was interested in long-term virgins. Um, so it makes you think of the Steve Carell movie. Um, but she was interested in what, um, you know, when people wait a long time, or not even necessarily all that long, um, what it triggers them to have sex. And so she was interested in a survival analysis of people. I think she used 18 as her long time cutoff. So it really wasn't, as a parent, you're like, yeah, that's, let's definitely make it into that cohort, please. But, um, but 18 year olds, and then she followed them to see um, what would, um, you know, what the triggers were of having sex. Obviously, a big one um, was, you know, getting married and other leaving home, things like this. Um, but we found in that cohort um, a data problem and that we had um, people who said they were virgins, but uh, they had children. And so for the purpose of that analysis, we were like, something's up, right? This can't be right. And so we dropped those, saying that we're just not gonna use those observations. We can't figure out what's going on. Um, but then later, somebody, I don't know who, um, one of us, um, you guys know the British Medical Journal Christmas edition? So this is a, yeah, so the British Medical Journal is, is a really good, you know, it's, it's not the Lancet, but it's pretty good. It's after New England Journal and JAMA, but a good medical journal. And on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, um, when you're supposed to tip everybody, I guess, if you're in the UK, they have an issue that comes out where they, they will tell you it's scientific. It does get indexed in Medline, but it's supposed to be lighthearted. And so some of the papers are like, why Rudolph's nose is red, and there was a study of reindeer and the capillaries and how the capillaries got enlarged when they were cold. Uh, there was a study, somebody had gone through, I thought this was a little bit less medical, James Bond novels and estimated his alcohol intake. And um, if anybody's shocked, um, you know, I've seen the movies, I've never read a novel, but apparently, based on the novels, he should not be able to stand up straight, much less drive a speedboat. Um, he was never legal, and um, so it was an interesting paper. And so we thought, we've got, we've got virgins who've had babies, like, we're so in this journal. Um, so we wrote this up, we looked, at, and what we did is we wrote a paper looking at what influenced reporting in that way. And so it was a really interesting experience um, doing this analysis. We had about 40 virgins. We looked at things that, the study has a lot of stuff. They have um, virginity pledges, whether somebody, had, that was popular for a while. Um, if you grew up in the South, um, I'm sure if somebody gave me one at church, I would have signed it, because otherwise my parents would have known I hadn't signed it, and then, then there would be a talk. Uh, you know, uh, they had um, a lot of questions about religiosity on the questionnaire, a lot of questions about the parent-child relationship on the questionnaire, um, like my mother would kill me if she knew I had sex, that kind of thing. And so it was interesting in the study, um, we didn't find any effects of like the month the baby was born. Um, we did find some religion effects, so there weren't any um, Jewish kids who were saying they were virgins who gave birth, for example, probably random. Um, but we did see some major, of, um, some pretty big effects in that reporting based on people's relationships with their parents. There was a parent questionnaire and the parents who said things like, I'm uncomfortable talking to my kid about sex or I don't know enough to talk to my kid about sex. Those kids were more likely to be in this group of kids that reported in this way. Um, and so, um, and there were actually two groups. We, there were virgins, and then there were what we called born-again virgins. And those were the people that at wave one had had a partner, but by wave two had not had a partner. And, um, and those tended to be kind of distracted people filling out the survey, and we wondered, you know, maybe if they weren't having fun, they were that 14-year-old boy, you know, that said they had a lot of partners. But anyway, uh, we, had, we had a little fun. We brought in a priest because um, we didn't want to necessarily go to hell, those of us who believed in it. And so uh, we, there was a priest in Chapel Hill who got in a math degree, a PhD at Harvard, and he helped us out, um, which was good because we didn't know the difference to start between virgin birth and immaculate conception. So you learn all sorts of things. Um, but anyway, that was a fun side project on that too. These data are available. You can get them online. You have to, it's a little bit harder to get the sex data than some of the other data uh, because they do have network data. And so, um, so they know who had sex with whom when and who was friends with whom when. 
but super cool uh, for a variety of different projects. So if you're looking for a data set to illustrate a statistical method, that's maybe not the best way to develop a method, but sometimes it happens. Ad Health has a lot of opportunities if you can deal with the survey weight. Um, and then it got picked up by the media and we got lots of interviews, which was interesting and scary at the same time. So um, I even got a call not long ago about somebody who wanted to do a television show on pregnant virgins. And um, I was like, you better call my collaborator, Carolyn. And so, um, so but this was the best one by Slate. Um, and this was the estimate that we got, basically. Actually, if you wanted to go back and estimate a prevalence um, based on their reporting, we got one in 200. And so uh, what I wanted to do with the BMJ paper is have a little tutorial on Bayesian statistics and talk about prior distributions and how they can help us make sense of sometimes data that don't make sense. And I'd even gone through Wikipedia and tried to count all the gods and everybody else that they had said had had a virgin birth. You know, and, um, and there's a lot, right? Like in lots of different mythology, Greeks, a lot of Greek gods, some Latin Americans, some Hindu deities. And so I counted all these up and I estimated how many people had ever lived on earth and I had 100 virgin births out of that. And if you're not famous and you were virgin birth, we didn't count you probably because nobody recorded it. But anyway, I, I put a prior on. I showed how we could shrink this estimate right back down to zero, okay? Um, and BMJ would not let me pregnant, publish it because they said it was not scientific, that Bayesian inference was not scientific. <laughs> but one in 200, that's scientifically rigorous. So, um, so that was, and that was, it came down to a fight of do I want to publish the paper or not? And so I thought, well, I can publish the paper and then always tell the story on them about how they were so narrow minded that they let us say one in 200 self reported virgin births. So they didn't, of course, let us call it a real virgin birth, um, even though it happens in birds and animals um, sometimes. But, um, but they wouldn't let us use a prior distribution so, um, to shrink it. So it was an interesting um, example. Um, so just a summary there, that was, you know, for me that was a real fun project to work on for a lot of reasons. And one was because when I saw the data, I just had no, no clue what I could do that was sort of out of the box to answer the question. So I felt like if we were going to get a good answer to this question, we really had to do something innovative. And that was a fun way to uh, develop methodology. Uh, we still have some ongoing challenges, so computation is one. Another is validity of responses and measurement error. So we did not do anything in this analysis to take out um, responses that we thought might be outliers or might not be valid. Um, of course, at, at 13, 1,000 partners, that probably wasn't true. But there were people that had you know, 500, uh, several hundred partners in the course of the study. This is a population representative sample. There were sex workers in this study. Um, we know their occupations. And so, so that's an entirely reasonable um, count. And even if you start thinking about somebody that hooks up every weekend after a while, it starts to start, you know, the numbers start to add up. And so we haven't done anything around measurement error, the influence of outliers in this yet. Um, and then in terms of policy implications, uh, it was just really interesting to get some more sense on what was normative. For a lot of these measures, there was a lot of error when they were really young, and then the, the figures got much clearer as they got older. Um, discrepancies across some of these measures could be useful for things like sexual education or screening for depression and things like that.